at this step, that's not an issue. All right, let's uh, take a look at the next coral we see. Take your pick, Dan, of any of those corals in the back. Let's see if we can, oh look. Up oh, there's another one. Dun, 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 wow. dun, dun, dun. This appears to be the place for those um, not radiolarian radiolarians. You want to uh, try a zoom there, Amber? Let's see if we're... I probably have to move the vehicle. I don't know, you might be able to see something from here. Seems like a long way away. Yeah. So we got brittle stars on both the primnoids. And then actually it looks like that. Oh, well, I can't tell if that's a zoanthid overgrowing the primnoid or something else behind it. Also got a little comatula crinoid hanging out on the on the substrate down there. Yeah, that's definitely zoanthid overgrowing as well, that golder color. So that's a a parasitic zoanthid that's more or less stealing the skeleton of the, the primnoid or the paracleptophora over there. All right, Dan, we're good with this image. Um, and if we can fire a Niskin here as well. Oh, I draw that Niskin. I will also say that we haven't taken a rock sample. We got one just after you left. Oh, <laughs> okay. Like you literally walked out of the van and we snagged one. If I had to blindside me like that. But it's cool that we got to see one of the um, crinoids regrowing. Yeah, I'm really excited about that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do have our friends online. They're wondering, like, how could we get updates on the snail on the crinoid after you have looked at it more? Is there... Yeah, we'll uh, give something to the comms team and we can put something out on social media um, if we get any good pictures of it. Um, but I will say it'll be a, it'll be a while before we have any kind of scientific conclusions about it. Right. But we can certainly maybe put some lab photos or something up. So we're going to collect uh, a couple liters of water here um, for EDNL analysis since we've got multiple different um, types of coral here and all the crinoids um, and uh, one or two sponges. So our partners at Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Boston University will um, be analyzing um, these water s this water sample we're about to take for uh, environmental DNA. Neskin number one has fired. And That's sam sample 034. 034 Neskin one. Uh, want to zoom in, uh, full zoom there. can push all the way in there, Amber. So what is that little white speck? That's an anemone. Oh, so oh, and he's uh, enclosed yep. or in his little anemone house. Yep, so we've got, in this shot, we've got uh, some type of paramercy here in the foreground. 
Are you talking We've about got the uh, Primnoid in the background, uh, and then a little Chrysogorgia uh, in the right next to the um, crinoid stock. So sure. we've got three different families of coral all right in the same shot here. And then this Paramarissia in the foreground has um, multiple Brittle Star Associates, and it looks like an anemone. So cool. Oh, and actually it looks like that might be a little Xenophyre 4 um, in the back left on the, just just next to the um, Primnoid. That white kind of scallopy looking thing might be a, a, a Xenophyre 4. So front row, how's the ship holding? Considering I haven't broken out my snorkel yet, I figured that was the case. Right. Are we cool? Then I am content to move on. Was that just a little squall line that moved through? So I can't believe it. I took a 15 minute dinner break and I missed the snail eating the crinoid. The big murder mystery of this expedition well, or of this dive. It's probably not the the creature that is deheading the I crinoids. Say, they're pretty slow. Okay, that makes me feel better. I, I feel like I just missed out on everything. No, yeah. I suspect this is the association I was talking about the other day that was seen in the fossil record commonly like a hundred mm -hmm. million years ago yeah. and was only seen in modern times in 2017 for the first time. So it, it's probably that association, but we don't believe they collected it when they saw it last time. And so we'll actually get a much better idea on the snail now. Did y'all slurp it or just? It, snail hung on. So we were able to just grab the crinoid head and the snail came with it. And then hopefully the crinoid will grow back. I look forward to meeting that snail and crinoid in it's the wet lab. Good sized snail too. Yeah. This fancy new nav G here, does it have a DVL speed over ground on it? Where did we used to get that before? The old one. It used to be up here somewhere. Lynette, can you kind of tell us what Remember you're doing? Remember we do, we do speed runs and that's, I think that's the only place we got it, right? Or did we get it from the uh, sonar dine somehow? conversation. <laughs> Will you tell us what you were talking about, though? Oh, super secret. Sorry. Yeah, this is top <laughs> secret trade, trade secrets. So, um, yeah, we were just, um, we have an instrument on Hercules called the DVL, the Doppler Velocity Log. Um, it is an acoustic instrument that measures the velocity of the vehicle. Um, it knows which direction you're moving and how fast. Um, and we were just looking for a readout of 
overall velocity from that instrument, but. I don't think it knows which direction. I think it just knows how fast you move, right? Do you need a compass to, for the direction? Or does it tell uh, It knows direction based on the Doppler effect, right? Same as like uh, the ADCP. Just like a train going by. Yeah, I yep. guess it does have four deucers on it. Yep. Yeah, we get altitude and uh, <coughs> we can drive the vehicle in uh, velocity mode, so we command it to move at X speed. Does it have turbo? does have turbo. Sweet. <laughs> Afterburners as well. Does that mean we can drag race on the seafloor? I mean, we're ready to race any other ROV that yeah. comes in our view. <laughs> can there I be like an ROV rodeo? Sure can. <laughs> What about the cursor in the middle of the screen on the pilot cam? It's been driving me crazy ever since I sat out. You cannot. So Dan, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Robert Waters mm -hmm. is joining one of the interactions tomorrow. But right that 2.45 a.m. one is still available. Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is like, uh, I haven't slept for two days. It's my prime sleeping time. 100% agree. Who doesn't like a delirious interaction? <laughs> it could be a delirious <laughs> interaction. <laughs> You're going to do it? Ren signed up. You all oh, do it. Oh, Ren. Ren. I've been wanting to. Nice. Okay. You well, I don't think Ren has slept for it since he's been on the no, boat. No, no. I told Ren earlier, I was like, maybe you should hang Zoom in just a little yeah, bit, there. that floater? Oh, is that the same photo as Owen from the other day? Whoa, oh, it is. No way. Looks Spaceship number two. What? Very cool. Oh, that's so neat. Hold on, we haven't we haven't gotten in yet. I sure. Really? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah don't taper really my energy thing. level. That is so <laughs> neat. <laughs> oh, look at him go. Oh, oh he. Oh, and away he goes. Oh no, he's yeah. back. Looks like there's. <laughs> sort of, I don't know if that's just like. A little siphonophore string yeah. or something attached. I think to you it. could see it in the. Is that the bubble cam? No, that's the that's cursor the that you're <laughs> seeing. <laughs> no. Oh. The thing no. that's been driving Dan nuts no. all night. It wasn't, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> we should pick up that arrow that's in the, right in the middle of the view. Oh, oh that's a cursor. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, great job. Can we use great the slurp job. on that? <laughs> um, ooh, what is Are you seeing something interesting? I mean, if you get on the KBM and uh, oh, let's just set a bit. pick up Triclops, <laughs> you can move it. Maybe some sponges in the background, though. Oh, yeah, definitely some well, sponges. If you want to. What's right. the, I gotta what's do it over here though, where right this goes haywire. Or are those sponges? Yeah, they're sponges, definitely. Um, is it six. called triclops? It is. I think it's on six. Triclops. Yep. There it is. Yeah. It's like it, is that a uh, like an encrusting? Doesn't sponge want me to use sort? it though. Um, yeah. Uh, weird. Generally Interesting. That's no worries. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you. Oh, really? Talking. Yeah, it's really soft. Can you hear me now? It's still really what? soft. There's uh, a volume on the side. Data, Does nav. There you go. Any better? Go ahead. No. What? S Samantha might have given you my special headset that doesn't allow <laughs> talking. I was going to say, I was doing, I was we using one earlier. I'm so can sad that you know. All? Let me know when you can hear me. When I can see your lips moving, so that's kind <laughs> of a problem. I'm going to shut my eyes. Okay. Standby. You guys talking about Bell Pack? Yes. Let me adjust it. Here, let's see. Go. You, <laughs> you turn it off and turn it back on. Yes, ma'am. All right, there you go. So, that's the look at these cool sponges. They're like Can growing all over the surface. But that's my volume. That's not microphone volume. You know what? Just say what you want to say, and I'll repeat it. <laughs> okay. okay. That's um, gonna get so incredibly dangerous. I just increased so it. Fast. Um, um. Can you do I'm a so test weird. real fast? So, so yeah, there's what? sponges. Someone there's back. Crusting sp You're oh, back. really? We can hear you. Okay. Cool. Um, some sponges in the background. That like white thing on the rock. 
Definitely a sponge. And on the sediment too, yeah. Oh, that looks like a skeleton. Looks like a big, big coral that died. Um, oh. Yeah, and we still have some, yeah, corals. Oh, and there, oh, okay, is it still working? Yeah, there's a huge biodiversity on this seamount, which is really awesome to see. Um, too bad we were one day off on International Biodiversity Day, but hey, oh. <laughs> we're getting it in now. Um, looks like there's another glass sponge to the center right. Um, with a really big osculum, it looks like. Yeah. A lot more paramarosis. What's the osculum again? The osculum is the big center part, um, the like circular. The opening? Yes, the opening. That's the word I was looking for. Um, sponge mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but some sun sponges have like one osculum, like it looks like this one does. Some have a bunch. It all depends. Um, but that's what they use for their um, water vascular system, basically, to filter food and everything. Ooh. Looks like we have anemones on a, what is that? Yeah, it looks like there's an Can you hit uh, here, Norella down at the bottom there? Yeah. Some a um, paramarisid coral with a urchin on it. I, I just wondered if it was it's running. Probably, yeah, it's it. probably an anemone though. Yeah. But yeah, huge diversity of, oh, is that, do I see purple? Yeah, yeah it what looks is like that at the base of the Victor sea. Gorgia. Oh, Victor Gorgia. I think. I was thinking it was going to be one of those really cool sea cucumbers. Um, I mean, it could Are be. Are we setting I can't up quite for a little see, zoom here? It looks like a coral. I'm not sure who's talking back there. Adam's talking. He wants to zoom on the purple. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Who's driving this bus? Oh. <laughs> oh no. Do we have a Tesla? No. Um, yeah, so we have a fly trap. Um, anemone? Anemone, yeah. Some brittle stars. And it looks like there's a purple coral down there, um, which is really cool. Is that Victor Gorgia? Okay, now go um, zoom in on the purple guy. Um, most can't quite see from this distance. As we get in, the yes looks like it. Ooh. Really pretty. Go, uh, go full zoom there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yep. Wow, that is so beautiful. Really awesome color. What a great shot. And I love how it's accessorized with the orange <laughs> crinoid. I mean, uh, ophiroid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think Vogue magazine really? should be putting that on the front cover. <laughs> Great zoom. Thank you so much. But yeah. It's a really neat instance of color in the deep sea. And you can zoom out if you'd like. So that's like three different corals within like yes. five centimeters of yes. each other. They're all related to can each other, I believe. Can you pull up the DSC there again? Um, they're all most likely part of the same yep. family, but yeah, three different species for sure. Yep. Or you can do it on Mon, right? Go wide, please. Oh, and a little, a little brittle star on the rock. Do it on this one. So I don't know if you saw it, Sarah, but it looked like there was like Still almost count. worm things hanging off. Was that wormies? Was that bacteria? Was that fungus? Or I didn't them? see them. Um, the were you referring to the the brittle star? No, like the orange like or you're seeing things hanging down like party streamers. Oh, what? I did not see that. Good Good eye. eye. Um could have been some sort of parasitic uh, something. But it was down on the five. rock. On the rock. Not oh, the still coral. moving, isn't it? Oh, on the rock, not the yeah, coral. Yeah, not on the coral, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, I didn't see that. They could have been they could have been some sort of worm. Yeah. Um not sure some sort Come of encrusting worm. Faster. But I didn't quite get a and good look at it. It could be like, it. you know, worms that chewed through some sediment and left their little yeah. tracks behind too. Gotcha. Come on. So that brings up a viewer's question, which is, is there fungus this deep down? 
Uh, no, I was just um, trying to get a slow could cam you, here. Could you verbalize that, please? I'm nodding my head <laughs> because I was afraid <laughs> to say the words, but yeah, there are there are fungi like that live down here. But not big mushrooms, but mm -hmm. like you know, single-celled yeah. organisms. Yeah, kind of similar, probably similar to like bacterial mat sort of thing. Or okay. And uh, yeah. data, can you make a note in that uh, we're trying to get a still camera, close-up still camera picture of this guy. Yep, copy that. Yes. Yeah, oh, that's going to be beautiful. Great picture. There Mom it is. Whoa. Boom. Got it. Woo okay. We're out of here. Are we still holding, oh, by the that. way? That's a nice shot. We are not. Okay. Um, I got to run. I'm getting uh, towed by the boat. I forgot it was still <laughs> moving. <laughs> I was going to say, if you guys would like to move forward, please do. <laughs> so some viewers online said that that those little thingies hanging off could have been scrolling a barren coral. Yeah, you can, You want to stop her up okay. if you haven't already. Yeah, so it could have been some sort of up. black coral. I I'm totally not sure. forgot yeah. it was I know they can be really Bridge small. nav. Or forums or hydro. Can we hold position here, yeah. please? Thank you. Tons of options to Thanks for that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you even answered a biological question. Yeah. So while biology is talking down here, Dan and Ren, I totally told Ren to hold off on signing up for that shift because I was I knew he has been working his butt off. Same as all y'all, but thank you, Ren, for signing up. You asked for one this morning, and it has appeared. 2.45 in the morning. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so Lynette. Just when you thought it was safe to hop off SPL. Ooh, there's like a big, oh, <laughs> we probably want to catch up with the ship, but um, there so was a big you know, amalgamation a bunch of, of organisms just below yeah. us. Can you feel take it off? Feel free to sign up for one. Uh, I, I was going to stop and look at the I have never big basket done an star, but I can't. Can I be Log here in. first? Ooh, a big, um, sure. Exactly, <laughs> valid, big glass one. We have a, a whole day planned for him tomorrow. All right. We'll see what we can do. They're super fun, especially, um, now Ren likes the kids Ooh. that you can talk technical with. I like the little ones because they're so fun. Yeah. Yeah. That does sound fun um, and intimidating. Oh, with associates. Yeah. Some feathers. have to do Ooh, some iris the there, there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Some feather stars. Um, let me just get an ID really quick. Here we go. We've seen a lot Matt of biodiversity data. since you went on to the break. Uh. So I got, I got that longitude and latitude for you. Uh, I will latitude, eight decimal three four five degrees. Yeah. Longitude, yeah. negative one six four decimal four. three one seven degrees. Cool. You're welcome. That was a rock. You're welcome. Who got the rock? Mike got a rock? Guess so. I haven't got any rocks. <laughs> Heck. Well, we got two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> Adam's in here now, isn't he? How come uh, we're not Adam getting just a rock? Back down. Uh, uh, I already kicked him back out. <laughs> So we have a request online. I think this goes out to Brian. Can we find some tuna kits? We certainly may. Like Lynette said, we have another two and a half hours. Yeah, find a good the night is young. Find a nice predatory tuna kit. I can go for that.
Interesting sand piles here. Yeah. Uh, looks like the sand accumulating in the eddy behind the rock. Mm -hmm. So all the sand that we're looking at right now, where did it come from? Uh, like I'm thinking of beaches. Did it all come from like land and it's ended up in the deep sleep, deep sea? Uh, yeah, pretty much. You should be able to kick your auto heading in now. And um, most in the deep uh, sea, right. most Come of the stuff uh, that we get in the deep sea is runoff from land. Do a uh, half turn clockwise. So. You can also get lots of different America. plankton bodies, basically, of type from types of sediments and down here and as well. Yeah, I'm only speaking from the geology standpoint, not from the bio, bio standpoint. <laughs> a lot of deep sea sediments are, are defined by um, the biological component of them, silicious oozes versus carbonates and whatnot, too. A radiolarian ooze. Yep. Calcareous ooze. There's a lot of them. Okay, There's a lot of oozes. I'm going I'm wow. to come to your right, so you can follow me around to the west there. All right, now you'll come back to the left as I come uh, to the west of you. You can come up just a bit, maybe. Five meters, maybe. Can we look at this one, please? Yeah, <coughs> bubble gum. Yep, I think that's the first one of the dive. Bubblegum is Paragorgia, correct? Yep. Yes, I'm getting my corals down. All right. Yeah. Okay, Daryl, you can push in a bit there for us. Thank you. So this is a bubblegum coral, or Paragorgia. It's probably one of my favorites. They can get absolutely huge in certain places. Pacific Northwest. That is one of them. And the, and the Atlantic Canyons uh, yeah. on the east coast of the U.S. Discovery Corridor off to Canada as well. Yep. Typically have at least one of these astroschema um, brittle stars that living in them. We've seen them mainly with the polyps out. I've seen three or four so far this expedition. All of them have been um, polyps out instead of retracted. They get their name from when they're retracted. It looks like someone just stuck chewed bubble gum all over their skeleton, basically. It's where they get their common name. All right, I'm good here. All right. Let's see if we can get the DSC to click on the way out. Back up. That's no ground fault. It's just a uh, idiot light changing from green to red when it drops below one meg. But yes, thank you for. So is the Roman spectrometer turned on this whole time? Yep, it's running. Uh, I don't know, actually, uh, their systems are on. I don't know if they're collecting data or not. Yeah, that's because I'm not sure. Oh, uh, they just, uh, they shut down the instrument. It's just their camera is on, so we can keep an eye on it there. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Dan. I feel like that would be so much, so, so much, much data. data. So I was sleeping when they were doing the Raman spectrometer test. Does anybody know? Was it successful? Was it a great test? Yep. I was sleeping too. <laughs> it was a successful test, but uh, we 
we decided to uh, leave it turned off on the way down, so uh, they weren't able to have the heaters going. So uh, the laser was, I don't fully comprehend what the uh, consequences of that are. But yeah, they got good data. They were able to uh, laser the bucket lid that we're carrying around on the front porch there. Awesome. I know Pablo was saying in about another two dives, they're going to start uh, using it on biological samples such as coral. I am looking forward to that. And by the way, Chris, I love the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. I wound up going east. <laughs> Got all turned around. Completely lost the plot. I was wondering what you were doing. <laughs> Just exploring. You should ask. I, don't know, I was following my nose. And <laughs> not sure why. I'm going to zoom in on this guy. Sea cucumber, holothurian, the tritivore, moves along the uh, seafloor, ingesting sediment and digesting right. any of the biological right stuff off of it, and then leaving cleaner sediment behind. So this has to be the most cucumber-shaped sea cucumber I've ever seen. Most we'll of them right look in. like eggplants or yeah. some other stubby. Oh, look at this tube feet, or it's tube feet. You can see them just kind of waving around. Okay, this doesn't look so much like a cucumber than I thought it did. <laughs> I think it looks more like a purple zucchini because zucchinis have those little nodules. Yeah. Except this is extra long nodules. What a cute little guy. So Corley, we have a question online and it is, since we see so many rocks down here, uh, do they all come from volcanoes and how do the volcanoes get this far out? Science is happy whenever you are done. Roger. Okay, now we can go wide. I think you can uh, kick her into gear if you want, on it. Okie doke. Um, yeah, so these seamounts are created from volcanoes. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to collect out here are unaltered basalts. So these are all basaltic volcanoes. So we're tr trying to get unaltered basalt so we can date them, so we understand when these volcanoes erupted and when they were created. The estimate is somewhere around the Cretaceous, maybe somewhere around 70 to 80 million years old. Uh, but we won't know until we get the samples and take them to a lab. Um, there's a group in Las yeah, Vegas that'll take them on for that us. Guy. And then maybe after we look at this cluster there. Coral, I'll explain a little bit more about how we get them out this far. So this is the Chrysogorgia. Um, I think it's actually different than the ones we've been seeing for the most part. It's bushier. We've been seeing kind of the bottle brush morph um, a lot. I can zoom in there. That's good enough for us, thanks. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, Corley. Oh, no. I love looking at Chris of Gorgias. Um, <laughs> um, but that was so earnest. Like, I love Chris of Gorgias. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm partial to Eritogorgia. That is my favorite deep sea coral. Um, but I'll settle for Chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgid. I don't know what they're called. Oh, here we go. You're asking you shall receive. Oh. oh. And look, it's perfectly curly. Just the way I like it. That's a really large one, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good size one. That's a couple meters. It's pretty cool. So, I, the scale is hard in the deep sea, but you can see the lasers down at the base. That's 10 centimeters. So, this coral is probably just shy of two meters. So, about the size of a, about the height of a human and tall and about, I don't know, meter and half a meter in uh, diameter. So it would feel like you were standing next to a human-sized coral. 
You can get a good uh, perspective in the pilot cam there in front of Ren. Oh. No, I was saying if you look in the pilot cam, you can. Yeah. Takes up most of the front porch of uh, Hercules. Yeah. So because corals are so slow growing, does that mean that this coral is very old, like ancient? Yeah, this coral is, is hundreds of years old, certainly. Anybody see any jellyfish on it? Uh, I can't, but I think I see a squat lobster and yeah. a shrimp. Yeah. I see a shrimp and a squat lobster for sure. There's something in the back, though, kind of near the... Like on the left. Yeah, there's something. Like a darker, like pink. Uh, that oh. arm up there has got some kind of color discoloration. But no, I don't see our target jellyfish anywhere on here. All right. I think the science is good, but we're, feel free to hang out if we want to do any beauty shots for video's request. Let's see if I can get a DSC on the way out, maybe. We got some beautiful videos. So a viewer online says that seems like everything that we talk about just magically shows up, and they're asking if we can start talking about octopus. I would love to see an octopus. Uh, last time we were out here. That was a uh, DSC, if you're we making saw, like, notes back there. Three jumbo Thanks. octopuses, and Ooh. I was on watch every time we saw one. Yes. I feel pretty fortunate to have seen that piglet squid. Yeah, that was cute. I want to see another ghost octopus. But we're, we're way too shallow here for them. Um, but, okay, to go back to the volcano question yes, really please. quickly, um, uh, there's actually a lot of volcanism that happens in the ocean. Uh, in fact, 70% of the Earth's volcanism takes place in the ocean, uh, which is pretty cool. Most volcanism happens along mid-ocean ridges, um, which are these divergent boundaries, if you think about plate tectonics, uh, that kind of line uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Um, so you can like search mid-ocean ridge plate tectonics and you can see where they're located if you feel so inclined. But then you're wondering how volcanism, we're in the middle of a plate, we're in the middle of a tectonic plate, how does volcanism get out here? Well, that's due to hotspot activity. For a quick zoom there, Joe. So hotspots are uh, these little spots that in the mantle that create hot magma. Um, and they create different go, uh, islands. Like <laughs> go full zoom, uh, zoom in on the critters there. Like Hawaii, but Ooh. we also think that they created wow. things like the Line Island volcanic chain. Or there, right. that's partially to explain. We don't exactly know how the Line, Line Island Islands was were formed. created. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we're out here is to try and better constrain. Was. Uh, oh, sorry. In one of the cameras, you can see the little shrimp. There he goes. Go, little friend, go. Yeah. But I think the, see the shrimp in there are probably trapped in that sponge for the rest of their lives because it's closed off. Well, at least they have each other. <laughs> <laughs> Except those looks might like be two different species. Oh, no. <laughs> it looks so like the one on the right so. is uh, pregnant. And the one on the right certainly might be gravid. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Can uh, go wide. Thanks. What was the word you used, Brian? Gravid. Gravid. I have never heard that just to describe pregnant. Me neither. We bio, <laughs> we bio just have Latin to make everything sound fancy. <laughs> I'm going to try that one on my wife next time she's talking about Geology. <laughs> make up random words. <laughs> oh. So we've had a, a couple of viewers online saying that what we have been calling a piglet squid is actually a Japatella diathana, and it's actually uh, an octopus. Mm. Yeah, so Dr. Google, come on to the rescue. Oh. 
might just be right. When you Google that that word, Japa Intella yes, Diaphana, the first Big thing one. that comes up doesn't even look like an organism. It looks like a crochet pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Should be able to come left now, hopefully. You're not wrong there. Woo. Come up, come up. But you're right, um, or the viewer's right. If you do go down, I'm okay. it does it look very similar. Uh, no, I'm stuck on it myself. You can uh, come left. So no longer can we call it a piglet squid, a Japatella diaphana. Hey, what now? <laughs> So it's not 100% confirmed on the science side, but a viewer online said that what we have been calling a piglet squid is actually a type of octopus called a Japatella diaphana. And if you Google search it, it does look pretty, uh, looks pretty correct there. It's a pretty fancy title. Like Brian said, sometimes biology just likes to make up words. Feels fancy. But I don't know, Coralie and the geologies might take the cake with Botry Idol. I, I constantly feel like the words that we use in geology are 100% just made up. <laughs> I did have to, I did look up like, what does Botry Idol mean? And in Latin or Greek, it means a bunch of grapes. See, we use Latin too. Those well, just aren't the only ones who can use that. <laughs> can you put the sonar back up there? Engineering. Thanks. We can all share Greek and Latin together. <laughs> There's enough room for all the sciences. Some uh, cool features here to the south. Not the way we're going, of course. Can you uh, bring your head to the left and look up a bit for me? Nice rock of coral, rock face of corals coming up here. Ooh, I love that geological, I don't know what to call it, design. Maybe you stop her up there, Lynette. Okay. Or maybe we could follow this to the right. Bridge now. Can we hold position, please? Thank you. Look up just a bit more. See if we go. Oh, you're seeing over the top. I can see now. I'm good, thanks. Oh, wow. That's a great shot. This is a pretty cool we formation, could too. Drop back down and kind of get a closer look at what's living on the, the uh, side of that wall once you get safe. Right it. Yeah, I'm good. Right. So this last one time to see we where the top here, was. So. And we saw one of these kind of mass wasting geological formations. We also saw a lot of biology on the side of it. And I don't remember what dive that was or what side of the um, the feature it was. I know that that probably has a lot to do with where, like, where the current is hitting. Probably has more to do with where you see these really dense. Um, biodiverse and biodense areas. I do think it's interesting that two times this has happened. To see uh, this high amount of biodiversity on... Yeah, like on this like type of formation. And this is still basaltic rock. Well, that's what I was just about to ask Coralie. Is, yeah. is, are we in the carbonate here, or is this, this so, is basaltic underneath? So sometimes when we've like sampled it, it does kind of come off as mud. So definitely a softer rock. Um, Honestly, we w we won't know until we sample it and see what's inside. <laughs> Just look at that layering. It looks it looks limestoney. It looks, it looks yeah. like manganese encrusted limestone to me from the structure. It's you saying you want to sample it, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> biology. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, if the predator arm can break off a chunk, but if yeah, it, it can. 
If it is, Delta Dan can make anything happen. If it is this mud, it would try. actually break off pretty <laughs> easily. But if it's basalt, it won't break off so easily. But also sometimes the mud is kind of hard to break off as well, so. So if this is not basaltic, so basaltic means that it was formed by volcanoes. Mm -hmm. So if this is carbonate or carbonic or carbon in origin, how is it formed then? Uh, I think a lot of the carbonate that's formed is from shallow water reefs. Um, oh. That we see around these areas. Yeah, so geos, geos which are diving on flat top sea mounts or table mounts, um, we're pretty sure all were exposed to surface waters at some point, and that it basically erodes off the pointy end of the volcano. Um, and makes these flat table mounts. And we assume that they had shallow water coral reefs at this latitude at some point while they were um, near the surface. And so most of them have a carbonate cap that is made up of old coral reef on top of the um, igneous basalt underneath it. And since we're right up around the top of it, it's very possible this has uh, got carbonate underneath the manganese crust. So is this a seamount or a geo? Because I thought we were diving on a seamount. Uh, I would generally say a geo is a subcategory of seamount. Okay. So one of the one of the deep sea puzzles I have is why filter feeders like to live in underhangs, overhangs, however you want to phrase it. If they're dependent on food coming from the surface of of the ocean, why would they hide underneath a rock? where they can't catch things directly falling from the sky. So the current is probably able to make its way down here. Do you know, do we have any idea where the current is or what direction it's coming from? It seems to have been coming out of the northwest if I've been following Dan's current updates properly. Yeah, it's <laughs> at the moment I would say it's coming uh, left to right along the cliff face there. Uh, your heading is south. You're heading south, so east to west. So Dan, is it easier to drive the ROVs like vertical up this kind of a wall or is it easier to go like slowly, gradually up like we were doing for most of this dive? Um, Either way is pretty easy. It's way more fun to poke around on a overhanging cliff like this still. <laughs> so for everyone who's watching at home, the, what we're doing here is I'm just trying to document the, the whole wall. So we most of these organisms we've gotten a good look at enough to kind of identify for the region. Um, and, but we're just trying to get kind of a holistic view of um, all the different corals and where they are on this feature um, before we continue on. This is also, this is nice enough. I'm, I may attempt uh, a 3D reconstruction of this wall at some point using a, a, a system called Structure for Motion um, video. We can take the video, put it in, um, to a, a computer program, and the computer program looks at the different angles from all the different video shots and can build a three-dimensional reconstruction of the rock and the corals here um, with you know, sub-centimeter accuracy based on video alone. I don't even have to give it navigation information. Um, and yeah, Dan, I think you're already are anticipating what I was going to ask for. Yeah, um, the sponge? Yep, please. I do. Is what you're describing similar to photogrammetry? It is a form of photogrammetry, yep. Well, that is on one of our, let's highlight that. Oh, I get to test my new bumpers here. Ooh. Okay, Daryl, zoom in there. Yep. Ooh, that's a cool sponge. Yeah, it's very pretty. Another one of the glass sponges. 
All right, that's great, Dan. Thank you. Okay, you can go away, please. Was that it for photogrammetry? What? Never mind. Yeah, see, like, explain to me how that makes sense for filter feeders to be <laughs> in that little tiny crack in there. <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> I'm going to have to find some fluid dynamic modeler to work with me to understand what particle flow of, of food-sized particles might do on a crack like that, because it just doesn't make sense to me. Because even looking at her, I mean, maybe this is, like, not the right way to go, but there looks like there's tiny little particles floating around, but they look so, they look like they're not going the right way. Yeah, my current, my current guess is, is that you, it might see this in higher current areas where you, you, they there's a happy medium for the current speed and for them to be optimally efficient at feeding. And so in environments like that, they find lees, you know, turbulent areas that are out of the direct flow. Um, if we were near an island or some big source of sand, I'd say it was also potentially to avoid sedimentation, but there shouldn't be, we're basically on the top of the feature here, there shouldn't be a big downwelling source of sediment here. Um, so it's gotta be some kind of current flow pattern. Uh, this is beautiful. This is a really, really nice spot. Almost almost completely made up of paramarsias with a few um, primnoids thrown in and then on top all of the uh, um, crinoids and that one paracliptophora there on the right. All right, um, before we leave this area, I'd like to trip another Niskin. If we can get kind of close to the, closer to the, all the organisms. Um, all right, you want to be in the uh, underhanging zone there? It doesn't matter if we have to be in the underhanging zone. If you want to just take a tow somewhere, um, you yeah. know, within a couple meters of the corals. Can do. On top or? Doesn't matter. Here. Doesn't just matter. Nope. Right. Just close-ish. Find something to look at while we're doing that. And so, with the Niskin thought or Niskin bottle, you are trying to trap eDNA, correct? Yep, we're just gonna take a five five liters of water, um, or two and a half, whatever the Niskin size is, uh, and then we'll just filter two of that, two liters of that water through a uh, <coughs> very extremely fine filter. Uh, and then send that to a uh, couple collaborators at the Pacific Northwest Fishery Science Center and at Boston University. Uh, and then they'll do their magic and get the DNA out of the filter and get an idea of all the different organisms that are, we can see traces of their biology in the water column, basically. And that they're trying to build a reference data set of um, getting a sense of how, which organisms show up most common in eDNA versus others, so we'll take document Good document what all's here in the Save area. in there for a minute, Daryl, if you um, want, while I'm getting the minute out. Um, through visually and then see if the same organisms show up in the eDNA samples. Uh, and then that same group is also taking subsamples of anything, sample we collect um, to, com to basically match up the DNA sequences they see in the water column with the DNA of the individual organisms that we can identify. That was a great explanation, thank you. It's a really potentially powerful tool. There's lots of questions about how long the DNA stays viable in the water column and, um, and you know, are slimy organisms that slough off lots of tissue gonna be overrepresented than um, other okay, organisms go that wide, produce please. less or slough off less skin cells or whatever. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of really important work to be done to kind of understand it as a tool, but it's showing a lot of promise um, as a non-invasive way to get a better understanding of the biodiversity of an area.
Uh, Roger, 035. Um, so sample 035 and Niskin 2. So Coralie, a question for Zoom you. Zoom in on the star there while I'm putting this thing away. Why don't you want to grab a sample from this wall? Why would I? Why, like, why aren't you? Why am I not? Uh, heard the question um uh yeah but i mean if it's the salt under there it's going to be hard okay, to you just can go wide, please. lob off a part of the wall because basalt is a really hard rock um this is looking more like it could be basalt under there right now this like bumpy texture oh, look there's a rock right there kind of proves oh a rock <laughs> <laughs> there's a rock there's a rock everywhere <laughs> Laying right there, I'll just grab this, pick it up. <laughs> Going once? No, we're all good. Roger. All right, I think we'll go with this wall if you want to go ahead and hop up top. Okay, here Thank we go. Thank you. You gotta break off a rock. You can't just pick one up because it could have came from who knows where, right? <laughs> just ships throwing it overboard. Yeah. Those pesky glaciers. Yeah. Ballast rocks, confusing geologists since 1500. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna look around up top? Yeah, let's take a let's take a quick survey. Absolutely. I'll turn off the uh, disruptor here. <laughs> uh, no, we're all right there. Back down in the light here. I don't know if I'm moving too fast there, Brian. No, the speed's fine, but can you edge in just a little closer? Sure. Is that sea star on something? There. Predatory sea star? That's what I'm wondering. And if it is, I'd like to take a close look at it. Oh, yeah. I remember looking for days for that occurrence here. Uh, zoom in there for us, Daryl. Looking at that sea star there. Zoom in a little tighter. Predatory event. Found the smallest coral to pick on. <laughs> See if I can, uh, if you go wide for a second, I'll get a little closer. That is a husky starfish. Yeah. Give me Patrick Starr from SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Look at the other side. You can probably see his tummy inside out. Yep. A <gasps> snack. Ooh. Brian, will you explain uh, what Dan was talking about, or Dan explain uh, the tummy out, uh, starfish's unique eating habit? Dan, you want to go for it? No, it will gross me out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, sea stars eject their stomach outside of their mouth and externally digest their prey. So what it would do in this case is it would be holding on with its two feet, and it would get its mouth really close to the coral, and then would wrap the coral up in it with its stomach. Uh, and then digest it outside of its body. I 
Uh, you come down a few meters. Big hole is here. I'd like to see what type of coral it's munching on. We understand really nothing about trophic okay, dynamics we'll and stuff like that in the deep sea of who eats what. Push right in, full zoom. The controls on the ecosystem of whether the predators keep things in control or sickness does or any number of different um, things. Is that a right. <coughs> that is a brittle star? Or? Brittle star tied up with the sea star on what looks like some type of paramaricia. I'm not sure if we're watching a slow moving fight or an unholy <laughs> love match. <laughs> Given the size differential, I think it's more like a massacre. <laughs> All right, I think that's all I need, Dan. Thank you. Roger. You want to see around the backside, do you? Uh, yeah, that would be lovely if, you, if you've got the tether for it. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, go wide, please. An online viewer said that the starfish is not husky. It's thick. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I like the body positivity word there, yes. Chris, would you just make a, uh, a free text notation for coral livery so I can find this later? Yep. Thank you. Got it. So uh, push in a little bit there, Daryl, while we're coming in for a landing. Right up. So Brian, as we're slowly ascending up this unnamed seamount, is there any particular thing that you're hoping to find? Okay, you can go tight. No, not a, not particularly looking for any certain same thing. Broadly, on this expedition, I'm interested in kind of exploring some of the same depth ranges and and the same sides of the features to see how much variability there is between seamounts. So what I'd like to do, <coughs> if the weather cooperates, is maybe go over to the east side of this feature and do a similar depth range uh, and see how right. the different sides of the seamount um, <coughs> Um, might vary. So here we are on the oral side of the um, of the sea star, and it's I don't recall ever seeing a predation event on Paramaricia before. So this is kind of unique. You know, we see bamboo corals all the time get munched on, and some of the others, but I this is a little bit different. Steve says that it's definitely necrotic tissue, that dark gray stuff on the paramaricia. Yep. So we've, in this uh, expedition, we have seen coral eating other corals, or jellyfish eating corals, so cnidarians eating cnidarians. Is there evidence of echinoderms eating echinoderms? I wish we could have a photograph of, of Brian's face right now for that. I mean, I kind of want to say I'd be surprised if it didn't happen, but I'm trying to think of an example and I'm not coming up with one. All right, so we would like to sample the coral. We don't need the sea star, but, um, and it doesn't right have there. to be this one. We can find another uh, one of these, but if you're, since you're already settled, if you can reach it, we'd like a snip off the top. Yeah, I think so. Give it a go here. Manipulators down to 10K. It might be a little spastic, but we'll see how it goes.
an online viewer saying that urchins are eat crinoids all the time and there are definitely some echinoderms that are very carnivorous or sorry not carnivorous cannibalistic Right about there somewhere. Yep, that looks good to me. A very small snip. That should be good enough for me. Enough. Yep. I do. About the. It's floaty or sinky, I think. Um, should be on the sinky side of the spectrum. It's not like it's not like a black coral where it's gonna like actively try and run away from you. Right. Uh, let's put it in one of those small boxes on the starboard side. We gotta get our uh, cat bowl printed up for the uh, snip and slurp. That would have been. Perfect one. Um, can you uh, extend the uh, starboard box out? We could tell them apart, it's okay. Yeah, he's in the forward one, so he doubled it up on that one. What's that? I think there's a rock in there. Oh, sorry, I should have asked. That's fine, we, we should have been looking too. <laughs> we were looking down in our notes. Um, I, think okay. we can, I think we can tell the rock apart from the coral. You can close the box now. What sample number? Uh, sample zero three six. All right. And then in the notes, can you put um, that Steve wants a subsample of that, but he says he only needs three to four polyps. We pretty much sent Steve all the calls. Yeah, oh, okay. He says the majority can go to. Yep. Okay. Let's go back in there if you want. Well, we're still in our toy. A little different angle. So one of the things another one of our collaborators, uh, Randy Rogen at Boston University, is really interested in is understanding coral livery across the uh, Pacific. So we've been discussing a project looking at all the video from all the exploration cruises out here to identify all the examples of coral livery, which is a really huge task. But it would be really, it'd be a nice thing to have a synthesis of all of the um, different coralivores 
and kind of an idea of which are, frankly, the tastier corals. Um, and like I said, Paramercia is one of the ones I would have said is not very tasty. Um, this being kind of the exception. Okay, we're ready to... Back row is... Head west. You can uh, go wide for it. I'm going to... Uh, you want me to let you get out front? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, might do a little uh, manipulator exercise, too, when we while we're coming around here. Lynette, what's our pull time for uh, midnight recovery? Um, it looks like we're planning to come off bottom at 11, but I'll see if I can get you a more accurate estimate. That's fine. 11, uh, uh, yeah. uh, that's good enough for now. Yeah, so... Roger. We're gonna... Somehow I got turned around here. I'm gonna spin around. Not sure how I got turned around there. Dan, do we have a 3D printer on board? We do. Okay. Uh, so we have a viewer that was asking, does the ship rolling affect the 3D printer? It does not seem to so far. Or, uh... Can I look at that one? Sure. What is a 3D printer used for? ROV parts. <laughs> We, uh, Ren just sketched up a design today to, uh, so we, uh, we talked a little the other day about how we've redone the, uh, the SERP gun there. Mm -hmm. But it occurred to us, um, the way it is now, we can't do, uh, in the, in the, uh, push core holder, we can't do what we call a snip and slurp. For example, that sample we just took, the little tiny ones we often, mm -hmm. Uh, snip them and then feed them to the slurp. So Ren sketched up a design that uh, will be similar to that, that we can uh, kind of have a little cat bowl feeder on the bottom of it, hopefully. So we're going to print up a prototype of that, see how that works out. So I believe this is a new coral for the expedition. This is probably hemichorallium. It's certainly a corallid. Um, whether it's Corallid Day or Hemicorallium, I get lost. Um, but these are precious corals. Why are they so precious? Uh, they, in shallower water, there's actually a commercial fishery for them. They make very pretty jewelry. So people will um, collect them and polish them up and make jewelry. So I was reading earlier that most of the black coral can be uh, used for jewelry, though. But it's um, highly unsustainable except for one, I believe, one coral farming place in Hawaii. Do you know anything about that? I do not. I, I know it was used for, I know it's been an unsustainable fishery at times, but I don't know anything about the, the one, the farming. Okay, attempt. you can zoom in there a bit. That, uh, Coral washes up on the beach in uh, Okinawa. And there's, if you go on the tourist street in Okinawa, there's all kinds of coral jewelry. So the people there just, you know, walk along the beach and pick it up and polish it, make jewelry out of beautiful jewelry. I was reading earlier about how in so many Polynesian cultures, black coral is seen as medicinal, like almost having otherworldly properties. I would love to know if there's anybody online who can comment more about that. So it's a really pretty coral. Um, and with a basket star on it, it's got lots of associates. It looks like at least two different types of brittle stars, uh, uh, comatulate crinoid, and 
some hydro hydroids there on the top on a dead branch. But can you tilt down and pan slightly right? There was something that I want to see where the interface between the yellow coral and the hemichorallium. Yeah, can we go tight on that spot right there? Yeah, stand by. Let me adjust the heading in here a bit. Kind of balanced on the left side there. Okay. Okay, Daryl, go, go tight there. So, check this out. These two corals are competing for space, so they're having a war. And that little paramaricia has carved out a spot in the hemichorallium. And there's basically, they, some corals have special tentacles used for warring with other corals. I don't know if that exists in the deep sea, but it does in the shallow water. But at least the, still the stinging cells of these are probably, these two corals are probably stinging each other. So there's probably about a one and a half tentacle length gap between uh, go the hemichorallium and the paramaricia there where they're battling for space with each other. I think that's good. We got what we needed out of that. Roger. This couldn't get her quite stable there. Yep. I could come around here if you want. No, I think I think we got a good enough shot. That was. Yeah, I see it. Not precious coral. Um, it just sticks out so much compared to everything else. So apologize for my backseat driving, but y'all are showing a zero ohm um, resistance on DC ground fault. Yeah, we're troubleshooting okay. it now. Sorry. A viewer online said that the name antipathies means medicine or the cure for suffering in Greek. So they thought pretty much all corals, all antipathies, were medicinal back in the ancient days. Oh man, you can see like where we all came from. Okay, we're going to have to uh, head down the hill if we want to go west. So. I feel like we are looking into the abyss. Uh, Daryl, some of your cameras are going to go off there for a minute. Probably wouldn't hurt, yeah. Let's drop down into the hole here while we're... All right, yeah. You ready for a move, Dan? 
No, I'm going to uh, drop Publishing. down here. And okay. Oh, that's annoying. Also, looks like we lost the down looking camera feed. From uh, I turned it off. Yeah. Oh, you turned it off. Okay. okay. Sorry. Did not realize that. Hey, you want to do a. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what's. Uh, Turn off the DVL for a minute here. Go to your alarm page for me. And uh, tell me when Herc says last heard from zero seconds. Right updated. Uh, a big number there. Here I go. Not up to 30 yet. I like the little shrimp that's just swimming by. Yeah. Well, that's, I think I found it. So we ascended up the south side of the seamount, and then now we're descending down the west side. Is that correct? So we're on the Gio as a whole is like huge, like 20, 30 kilometers by like 30 or 40 kilometers. Um, so we're working on two little pinnacles on the west side um, right now. And what caused these little pinnacles, I don't really know. Um, and uh, and so we're just, we started on one high, we're kind of going down the slope, and we're going to hit a valley here between the two little pinnacles um, shortly, and then we're going to probably hit a pretty steep section yeah. going up towards the next pinnacle, and then we were planning on ending the dive uh, at the top of Do the next pinnacle. 20 meters west, isn't it? But it's a little bit slow going right here. Going I do, uh, downhill is yeah, is difficult for 30 meters the rest. RV because basically, you, if you're going the direction of travel, you're just looking out into the blue abyss, and so we have to go backwards um, or sideways in order to maintain a view of the sky, uh, of the corals. I never would have thought about that, but the ROVs have a challenging time going downwards. That makes so much sense. If you can, if you can reach it, Dan, no hurt, no yeah, worries. You can't. can't. Okay. Uh, we'll move the Atlanta into deeper water here. And come down a few meters. deeper water please come down a few more meters then. when you hit the rock stop Ooh, a sponge yeah really <laughs> nice beautiful stock sponge there 
it's really amazing how big some of these um, yeah. sponges can actually get. That's probably good there. The jagged rock formation is really, really interesting. Yeah. Corley, is it a chance that these, um, <laughs> these... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't have much more to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it possible these little um, rises, hills, whatever you want to call them, are, are secondary volcanism on, that came up after um, the carbonate cap was in oh, place? Oh, like a dike or something? It's um, uh, zoom in there, Daryl. It's entirely possible. That'd it's just kind of hard here. to tell when everything's covered in ferromanganese crust. Yeah, um, certainly. That's oh, a beautiful shot. Sorry to everyone who has that, what is it, <laughs> tripe of, what is it, that fear of holes? I have never heard of that. Is it trypto... Trip, yeah. Tryptophobia? It's where the fear of holes, I think. I could be completely off. No, it does start with a T, I believe. Trypophobia. You want to come just a little bit wider and get the whole thing in frame for as your pirouette? It'd be a beautiful shot. Sure. Go yeah, ahead, do it. Uh, might blow it out here. I'm up against the wall. That's fine. Oh, and there's our first Victor Gorgia. Yeah. A little purple. Little one. The purple one. Steve and I were looking over the um, sample records for this area yesterday, or, and it'd be nice to probably grab a Victor Gorgia sample at some point. I'm not asking for that one, but if we see one, another one in then a spot that would be conducive for sampling, we might grab a piece. Is the white uh, below it? Is we'll that be a here for a while, that one. No, no, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying, I mean, let, you'll, we will do damage, I think, if we try and no, no, yeah. to that big sponge, if we try and get in that crack. It's but the white the one, the white the coral, one. is that the Paragorgia? No, no, the purple one up in the top right is the one we're talking about is Victor Gorgia. No, I know, but the one, the white one. Oh, the white one? <laughs> no, the white one looks, those look like primp moids still. Okay. We do that white, that white Paragorgia we saw the other day that had the Zoranthus okay, overgrowing Okay, go white, it. please. Um, we would. Yeah, we're, we're going to play around here until we get uh, Atlanta behind us. We, uh would like to go after one of those if we see it again. It's going to creep along the wall here for a minute until we get a Atlanta out. If you want to do water. some beauty shot work, that would, might be a good candidate for a really good um, video. Can you uh, bring up the DSC in the you could put it on this engineer computer here if you want. Here's our favorite Corley. Yeah, Roger. It is curly just the way I like them. I mean, I like these because they just look like like little fireworks, very celebratory. Even when they're dying, they still look like they're having fun. <laughs> 30 seconds is a long time. Snap. So Corley, I know you mentioned this the other night, but how long does it take for ferromanganese to accrue on the outside of these rocks? Um, really, really long time. So it's ferromanganese crust formations is one of the slowest processes on Earth. Uh, it takes about a million years 
I think the average rate of growth is uh, for a million years, one to 10 millimeters. Wow. Yeah. So some of the ones that we get back from well, this region go, uh, have, you know, six, seven stick centimeters. The so, this you know, that six million year old rock. 60 million, 70 million Jeez. years old. Yeah. Well, that's from when, that's from when the ferromagnese crust starts forming. But after, you know, after volcanism happens and you have a rock, it can take, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean ferromanganese crust happens immediately after the rock underneath it is done forming. So while this ferromanganese crust might have taken 70 or 60 million years, it could have been, the rock could have been erupted even before then. Yeah. You got over the, uh, yeah, you got tons of altitude now. Right there. Down we go. Slide back to the right here. Is that a little sponge right there, Brian? Yep. I did say I had a momentary thought where I thought it was an octopus, but I know I did too. Sponge. I definitely had a fear that this dive was going to be a lot of sediment, and I was wrong. Very happily so. Are you saying you don't like sediment? <laughs> yeah, not really. <laughs> no. I'm willing to go on record and say sediment's not my favorite thing. Sedimentologists <laughs> around the world are crying right now. Actually, I did my, bat my undergrad bachelor's essay in sedimentology. No way. So. Shifting bed forms of the Charleston coast. <laughs> so, Corley, a few minutes ago, you were talking about ferromanganese. Yeah, and I, t I turned it off. The slow accrual way. No, we don't need it. Of how how long it takes for that ferromanganese crust to to gather onto the rocks. And I know way back in the 1960s. Can you, can you go back to engineer and hit um, preset two, please? Way back in the 1950s, 60s, there was something with Howard Hughes, right? Where he was looking for the manganese nodule. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, OK. So I had to go back into my notes about this, but I actually did a talk on this. Um, but so there's hit, this yeah. uh, D, it's a now declassified CIA project called Project Azorian. And it was actually what? used to recover a sunken Soviet submarine in 1974. And the ship they used was the Hughes Glomer Explorer. But the cover up for this operation was that they were prospecting for ferromanganese nodules. What's that? Um, and because of that, uh, they were, there's this Sorry, huge, uh, it prompted this huge, Could like so much minute? research into ferromanganese crusts and nodules in the 1980s and 70s. Oh, we do this. Um, and it's actually thought that a lot of the people who are, if you were working on ferromanganese nodules or crust during th those years, uh, you were pretty much a part of the CIA cover-up, <laughs> whether you knew it or not. Um, yeah, so. But yeah, it was pretty interesting, actually. So it's actually kind of sort of because of the Howard Hughes 
CIA expedition that really led to a lot of research in ferromanganese. Yeah, it was kind of this boom for um, research into going, uh, like in the 80s. H11. Uh, and then it kind of went away a little bit, and now actually uh, a lot of the research is kind of um, yeah, and uh, again kind of like bubbling Zeus up. or whatever. In the Why is it that uh, that all this research is kind of seeing a resurgence? Um, I think because people are realizing right uh, that there's a lot of important uh, minerals and metals in these rocks. Um, and there's a Look lot to a uncover me. with them. I mean, there's a lot we can do with rocks that are this old as well. So, like, the uh, implications for paleoceanography. Yeah, we've been here before. Okay, you know, we're out of here. Uh, but, yeah. They did a couple test um, harvesting in that time period of manganese nodules, and it gives us our only long-term studies of what Come the down seafloor, the um, what happens to the seafloor, how does it recover after a harvesting. And a couple places, one off on the Blake Plateau off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, and another one, I believe, off the coast of South America somewhere, um, were the two big areas where they, they did these test recoveries. And... Recent work has gone back and visited these sites uh, again look uh, down a and little bit. found them more or less still devoid of life. Like some life is recolonized, but nothing looks nothing like the surrounding seafloor or what it looked like originally. Wow. Um, so even 30 something years later, um, those environments haven't even come close to, to recovery. Oh, that's a pretty one. That's yeah. another one of our large precious, co precious corals there with a whole host of crinoids on top. What is the scientific name for those? Is it Coradilium? Cor Cor Coral, uh, no, I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're Coralliums. Uh, Coralliums. God, that's a beautiful coral. That coral is huge. Look at uh, that coral is a meter, almost two meters across, probably. So this would be another extremely old, extremely ancient coral. Yes, absolutely. I, I, we know the growth rates on these. We don't know the growth rates on most of these corals, so I can't tell you how old it is, but it would not surprise me at all if it was several thousand years old. So one of the clips that we show a lot during the interactions is a 1,000-year-old coral. How do we find out the age of those extremely old corals? Radioisotope dating kind of like tree rings, right? Or and something? you can do some, some of them I believe have some skeletal stuff, but for the most part I think they do some kind of carbon isotope um, dating. Does that mean that we have to cut oh, those off are brittle the stars. Base? Or no brittle stars, basket stars, not crinoids. Look at that, that is all basket stars. Wow. Oh. So to find out the age, do we have to cut off the coral? Like especially near the base? I don't I don't know. So you would the the oldest stuff would certainly be in the base. So you, I would I would suspect that would be where you get the most accurate um, aging. Yes. Um, I'd have to go look up. Brendan Rourke um, has done a, the most of the aging in the Pacific, um, and I'd have to go reread re his paper on how they exactly they did it. But the the oldest coral ever documented um, is 4,400 years old. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was from, I believe, somewhere in the Hawaiian Island chain. Oh, I'm I vaguely for that thing remember. To take a I vaguely remember Steve once saying that I think you have to cut the base of the coral to. It wouldn't surprise me. Get it, to yeah. get the age. Sorry, Brian. I'm just waiting for the DSC to cycle a yep, couple times. No here. problem. Are you st are you just on a 30 second intervalometer? Yeah. Okay. Painful. A long 30 seconds. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. Um, 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 uh, let me come down another five. Probably. Uh, so we were, Corley, we were just talking a moment ago about ferromanganese and how it's kind of like a huge resurgence. And I know one of the big 
one of the big reasons that there is a resurgence is because we are depleting a lot of our land minerals and there seems to be a boon in deep sea mining. Can you give us a little bit of a background or even a little bit of history on that? Yeah, so um, that's pretty much true. That's true. Uh, the other issue, I guess, with land-based mining is that most land-based mining um, is uh, <laughs> uses uh, labor from the global the global south, um, and a lot of it, I think, for cobalt is something that's really uh, concentrated in these rocks. Right, I think. Um, and 70% of the world's co cobalt supply comes from the Congo, and uh, most of the most of these uh, they're called uh, most of the miners are called art artisanal miners uh, have work in really poor conditions. Um, they have no safety regulations. There's no there's no yeah. workers insurance or workers comp or anything like that. So definitely um, some human rights. Yeah, there's uh, definitely factors. like some human rights factors that people uh, take into consideration. Um, Congo isn't the only place. Uh, Indonesia also has a lot of artisanal miners. Um, but so that's one thing. But also yes, uh, once we deplete all of our resources on land, and it makes sense that we've depleted all our resources in land. It's way easier cool. to uh -huh. get to reserves on land. Um, People are starting to wonder what that are we going to do big coral. afterwards. So some people have been thinking about deep sea mining. Yep, this coral is the width of Hercules. Wow. Yeah, you can see the perspective there. And yep. The <laughs> Anything in particular you want to see here? No, good I'm, I'm just enjoying the beauty of it. I mean, the amount of, look at the amount of life that it, this thing is providing home. At least three crinoids, five, six basket stars, three anemones from two different groups, and then more brittle stars than I care to count. That kind of bright pink thing is, is that a an anemone as yep. well? Fly trap? A, uh, there's a fly trap. Fly trap there, and then those two are... Um, other another type of an enemy. I like that use of the telestrator. Never seen the counting function used yet. I'm a big fan of the telestrator. <laughs> These basket stars are massive. When we are done with the beauty shots, there is a cup coral down here on the right that I'd like to take a quick look at before we leave. Heard. What kind of coral is this again? This is some kind of corallid. Okay. Uh, the white ones I struggle with. It might be pleurocorallium, but... Hmm. So Coralie, going back to deep sea or sea mining, uh, I know some people see it as a green alternative to land mining. Is there some thought on that? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, no mining is going to be necessarily green. <laughs> um, also, a uh, fun fact, whenever someone tells you that mining is um, like sustainable or circular, it's actually not because it's just, that's literally not what mining is. Yeah. Um, so Very you're telling uh, me that clean coal is not clean. <laughs> Zoom in there. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of issues go, with deep sea uh, mining. Them on the like uh, Brian was uh, saying, uh, 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 after they took some of the nodules, they're, even 30 years later, the areas that they took the nodules from were devoid of life. There's a lot of pollution um, that happens right. with mining. Uh, I think one of the main things people are worried about are sediment plumes that can be released. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard about that. Create these anoxic right, environments. Right, okay, you can go away, please. Um, and so these ano anoxic environments make it so there's no oxygen, so any organisms that use oxygen yes, uh, um, die or have to leave and go somewhere else. Um, but also it's not fully understood uh, what these sediment plumes can do, 
uh, to different organisms, how far they can reach, how long they last, the full effects of them. Um, and then there's also other issues like the machinery that they use can create pollution, so toxic oil spills, um, stuff like that. And then there's also noise and light pollution mm -hmm. um, that can affect sharks and whales. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, this conversation is a, is a very new, you, can, you kind of have to see it with a lot of nuance. Yes, yes. Like everything that we talk about, there's always going to be pros and cons for everything. Mm -hmm. And it's important to, to realize that. There's some more little waves in the sediment. Beautiful bed forming right there. So, Chris, I want to ask you a question. I know let you are get, a... Let me get on the other side here. An I think we're at the bottom. Work. Are we? Okay. So, yeah, Chris, you're an avid let snorkeler. Let me get uh, a little Is closer to Atlanta. Yes. <laughs> Is there a favorite type or a common type of coral that you see over on Palmyra? What's that? Um, there, well, yeah, Palmyra's got yeah, an incredible yeah, diversity it. of corals. It's got some of the nicest um, and most number of species Watch of corals in the Pacific. Uh, some of the ones I really like are the um, big branching acropora corals. Mm -hmm. um, and they host a lot of fish, a lot of life live around them and in them. And they're really pretty, amazing colors. So how would you say that they compare to these deep sea corals? Uh, well, we found that a lot of them grow faster than was particularly thought. Um, they definitely grow faster than the deep sea corals. <laughs> um, they're a lot more... Uh, they're spaced a lot closer together. There you don't find them as distributed as far apart from each other. So definitely a lot of, you don't have to dive down to the deep to go see some beautiful corals and a whole no. slew of biodiversity. Actually the best, the best corals are within the, uh, within the top, uh, probably 20 meters. It's about as deep as you need to go for the, the really pretty mm -hmm. uh, shallow water corals. I'm going to turn off the USB L beacon first, just uh, 30 seconds, okay? You also, wait, are you talking about snorkeling or scuba -ing? Snorkeling. Oh, okay. You scuba though, right? Huge uh, snorkeler and scuba diver, yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Does everyone scuba? Well, not everybody, but yeah, not me. A lot yeah. of people do. do you, but you scuba, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm the only one who doesn't scuba. I don't know. I don't know if Daryl does. What's the question? Sorry, I didn't want to throw that to you because I knew you were right in the middle of something. But uh, we're talking about scuba diving. Are you a scuba diver or a snorkeler? Nope. I want to do that at some point. That's something that sounds fun. Just haven't had the. I don't live, I'm, a la I'm from Tennessee, so I'm a from away from all forms of deep water. <laughs> I got lakes, but that's all I got right now. You got quarries. That is true. There are some really deep quarries, but some of them are blue, and I really don't want to touch the, that. Yeah, my lab mate learned to scuba okay. in a lake or something. Yep, already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I learned originally to scuba dive. Sure. I want to learn to scuba. Through my school, I can do it for pretty cheap. I just take, I like enroll in a class or something, but I'm probably gonna wait until I'm done with your more PhD. done. Not yeah. done with my PhD, because then I don't get the- Discount? Di yeah. I can't sign up for classes once I'm not a student. <laughs> um, like maybe my fifth year or something. So at the start of the watch, uh, we I asked everybody what is their favorite cookie? And we had a lot of online viewers that joined in. So we have a viewer from the Maldives who says that Belgium chocolate chip cookies are the best. I don't know what makes a Belgium chocolate chip cookie different from a regular chocolate chip, but it does sound delicious. I suspect it's made with Belgium chocolate. 
Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is one way to make you hungry. At least we're having this conversation after dinner and not before breakfast tomorrow morning. Yeah. Oh, that would be torture. So most of the corals we're seeing here are kind of continuing the same kind of distribution of seeing a lot of paramaricias, a fair number of primnoids, with a few chrysogorgias mixed in. Come down. I think that's the dive. We've only seen one Victorgorgia, two coralliums, two coralids, and two aridogorgias so far. So the community, as we've been holding more or less a pretty even depth throughout this whole dive, plus or minus, you know, 30, 40 meters. We're staying in that same kind of zone with the same coral communities and continuing to see this these uh, big, That's beautiful good. sea lilies. Has probably the most, de uh, the, the highest abundant organisms, or most abundant. So going back to snorkeling and scuba diving, I know Wren is a huge scuba diver. But what about Dan and Lynette? Negative. <laughs> nope, never done it. And that was a negative from Dan? Yeah. Mm. Oh, and I forgot the Paragorgias. Here's Paragorgia number four. That's the... the there, quick zoom there. <laughs> uh, there. That's the purple one in the middle, or the pink one. This one. Yep. Okay. Looks like it's being invaded by potentially invaded by by some zoanthids down on the bottom of its near its base. Okay, it could go in. It's a really nice color, though. Yeah, it's looks like a Christmas color, like the vibrant of the red, vibrant sea of the red. So Dan, a question for you. What is the deepest that you have ever dived? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, 6,000, sorry, yeah, I had to think about that for a minute. 6,000 meters. Was that with Little Herc or with a different company? Uh, that was with uh, um, the Keel ROV from uh, German science ROV. Kiel 6000. Gotcha. Geomart. And that's about Mid Atlantic three Atlantic Ridge. Okay. 3.7 miles. Yep. Another nice rock here with a, a good little collection of the same corals you've seen that brown paracliptophore. Actually, this one I'm not sure we have seen yet. Roger. The branching pattern on this is a primnoid for sure, um, but I think this is a different genus than we've been seeing. Is that another basket star? Um, not sure yet. I see a crinoid bunch of brittle stars and a Venus flytrap anemone so far. Can I uh, hit Stokem on there again, please? Wow. So that I is beautiful. I think this might be a paracliptophora but a different species than the other paracliptophora we've been seeing most of the time here. Sorry, I'm just going to come up for a DSC here. Sure. They look dramatic with the black background. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm over it. What is a DSC? Digital stills camera. That's a uh, camera right there on the porch. Uh-huh. Unfortunately, I've Got it mounted off to the side, so and nobody's operating it, so it's taking a picture every thirty seconds. Okay, oh, switch okay. back to sonar. 
And that's the one that we go through at the end of every dive and click the highlights. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully Chris is making a I notation there. When nope, I'm snapping away. <laughs> I think what you look through is actually the video captures, Katie. Yeah. Not the, the yes. DSC is still in, in beta testing, so I don't think okay. it's worked into the whole data workflow yet. Uh, kind of, kind of does, but it takes it a while. Okay. Uh, I think Megan goes through them at some point. Uh, you can do a tight zoom there if you want, so you can see the polyps. A couple of shrimp are home too. Ooh. Yeah, look at the little dainty polyps. This really does look like something that Dr. Seuss would would create, would dream up. Reminds me of a kind of like the Lorax trees, how they all look like little pom poms. Oh, yeah. That's what those little polyps remind me of. Or the cherry blossoms in Washington. Right, science is happy. Roger. Okay, you can go white. Yeah, that one's really pretty. Yeah. So cool. That's got to be another extremely ancient, extremely old corals. What's that tan coral? Uh, it is also, it's, I, it's, it's some type of primnoid for sure. It might also be a different species of paracliptophora. to the uh, north of you there just a bit. Uh, maybe, unless I find another rock. Oh look, another rock. <laughs> That'll be a jellyfish. Oh, I didn't even see it. I still don't see it. Yeah. Where? You just swam off the top of the oh, right okay. side of the screen. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, play with the iris there just a bit for us, Daryl. Thank you. Can we look at this one? Yellow sure. bushy. Sure. Uh, probably good for a 20 meter move, isn't it? Look at all the decapitated crinoids. I'm Just telling you, we're going to go right around this boulder, and it's going to be some really big fish right there. I don't or think it'd be that big a fish. I don't think it'd be all that big a fish. Another really pretty paramaricia here. And okay, this nice is a basket star. star. And this is a basket star. What's the phobia, the, the Latin phobia name for fear of many arms? <laughs> Can I push in a bit? Yes, yeah. please. What is that hollow? Do you see that little ring? I do. And I have no idea. Oh, I think, well, it might be a sponge being held by that crab. Oh, 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 I see it. Yeah. Like a little decorator crab. I think that is a decorator.